Little Johnny's mother was getting ready to go to the grocery store, and she said, Son, I've got one thing to tell you this morning, that is, I do not want you to go down to the swimming hole and go swimming. I don't have anything else to tell you this morning before I leave the grocery store, but that one rule, do not go swimming. Well, later on that afternoon, Mommy came home, and as she came up the drive, she saw little Johnny walking up the street, and he was soaked from head to toe. And she walked up to little Johnny, she said, Son, I told you not to go swimming. Didn't you hear me? I made it as plain as I could say, do not go swimming. But Mom, he said, I, I went down to the water hole with the friends, and, and it looked so cool and so inviting, so I just stuck my feet in the water, and then that felt so great, and then I, I stuck my legs in the water, and that felt even better, and, and before you know it, I, I was in the water, but I didn't mean to do it, I didn't mean to jump in the pool and, and get wet, and she said, well, let me ask you one question, son, then why did you have your bathing suit on? <laughs> and he said, because I could not trust myself. This morning, we're talking about a subject that is one that over the years, as a preacher, as a Christian, as your brother, that I've faced on a daily basis, that we're all facing right now in our lives, and that is the heat of temptation. Now, before we go any further, we've got to define what is temptation. And temptation defined is the enticement to do something wrong accompanied by the promise of pleasure or gain. When I tell you this morning that there is temptation, I'm telling you there are things that you are dealing with right now on a daily basis that God is telling you it's not worth giving up into. It's not worth giving into. But Satan says, do it because it's going to give you this or you're going to experience that and you only live once, so take advantage of it. Now listen, there's a scriptural way to understand temptation. So let's look at what does the Bible say about temptation. What does the Bible say? Number one, it tells us that temptation within itself, listen carefully, is not sin. Temptation in and of itself is not sin. Look from the Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. It's on your screen. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Congregation, that is talking about the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is our high priest and he himself faced the same type of temptations that you and I face on a daily basis. Yet he did it without falling victim to sin. Number two, temptation is not authored by God. It is not from God. And a lot of folks get this confused. A lot of folks think, well, God is causing me to be tempted. God has never caused a single person in this life, even Adam and Eve in the garden, even though he placed that tree in the garden, he did not cause them to be tempted. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Do you get it? All right, let's keep going. Temptation number three is inevitable. What does that word mean? That means that you and I are going to absolutely, positively, without doubt, at some point, face temptation. The fact is, I, your preacher here at the Waters Road Church of Christ, am not perfect, and I face temptation. It is inevitable. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There are several parts of this particular passage or this scripture that we're going to underline and look at, and I hope that you will highlight this in your Bible and study about it later on in your week. It says, No temptation 
has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So it is, it's inevitable that you and I, just like any other man or woman, are going to face temptation. Number four, God does have the ability and Thanks be to God that he has the ability to control the intensity of the temptation that you're going to face in your life. God has that power. And if you look back at the passage that we just looked at, it says, once again, God is faithful and he will not allow you to face temptation beyond what you are able. Now, there's a a side note to that. A lot of things in life over the years I've said, now, uh, Joe, God's not going to allow me to face something that is stronger than me. But here's the kicker. The scripture also says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means sometimes I'm going to face circumstances, even temptation, that through the power of God's Holy Spirit, I can overcome those things that I maybe could not overcome based on my own merit. And that's the same here with temptation. So we know that God controls the intensity of temptation. Number five, God provides an escape from temptation. The last part of that verse says that God will also provide you the way of escape when you face temptation. Now, there's a lot there to chew on. And I hope that you'll think about those five things. I hope that you will go back and think about it, maybe go on the website this week and and look at it. We're trying to get our PowerPoints up on the website so that you can go back and study this material because I want you to understand that temptation is something that we're going to face and I want you to see with me this morning how we face it. All right, everybody take your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, hopefully there's one in front of you in the pew there in your area. And now everyone, everyone ever turn to Genesis 39. <clears throat> Let's share a story together this morning from Lord's Word. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food in which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left the garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. 
he came unto me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. She laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came unto me to lie at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard these words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Do you listen to those words? What a story. So the question is, temptation, how do we deal with it? How do we stay cool in the heat of temptation? Yesterday at my house here in Houston, I love kidding around with Phil and the folks helping me about the humidity levels right here in Houston, Texas. And we all think that the humidity level is around 80%, 90%, but in truth, yesterday it was only about 60%. So I had to rub it in a little bit that it wasn't quite as humid in Houston as everybody always says. Every year, a weather forecaster right here in Houston, Texas says, I don't believe it's ever been this humid in Texas ever before. I just want to slap him and go, last August. It's always hot this time in August. And you know what else? Temptation is always hot, isn't it? Listen, Joseph found out just like you and I are finding out every day that temptation is hot. It's heavy. And it's weighing on us. So how do we deal with it? Staying cool when tempted, good folks, write it down, put it in your heart. When you're tempted to do wrong, those who take sin seriously stand strong. So how do we deal with it? Number one, good folks, we've got to view sin for what it truly is. Now, in in our story in Genesis 39, when he was faced with that temptation, and listen, I never have seen a picture of what Potiphar's wife looked like, but I don't think she was uh, nasty looking. (laughs) She was probably a very comely, attractive lady. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been with Potiphar, right? So it's not like Joseph's just going, this ain't no problem. There ain't no way in the world I'd ever look at that because she can't even look in the mirror without breaking the mirror. (laughs) No, he's dealing with a real, true temptation. So don't make light of it and think, oh, it was no big deal. It really was for Joseph to face the situation. But when it came to sin, listen carefully. Genesis 39, verse 9 the part that I want you to pay attention to, it was not about sinning against Potiphar. It was not about the sin he would commit with this woman. It was about the fact that he was going to do this great evil. Now you may say, Jonathan, there's there's little sin. And then there's big sin, right? It's all one size. One size fits nobody. Sin doesn't fit any of us. We may want it to be a part of our nature. We may want to accomplish things through sinful means that we may not accomplish through integrity and honesty 
And you know in business right here in Houston, Texas, is there been a history of people that have done things through dishonesty and lack of integrity that have hurt other people in financial means? But what about you and I? When you're tempted to sin, are you tempted just to say, it's not that big of a deal? If I tell this little lie, Who's going to know? Who's it going to hurt if I cheat on my taxes? What is it going to matter if I do this sin and nobody at the Waters Road Church of Christ knows anything about it? you got to view sin for what it is. You've got to do the math in your mind. Know what it is. And now you've got to view it for who it's against. You see, the part of that passage that you need to pay attention to is the fact that he says it's a sin against God. Any time that you allow yourself to give in to temptation, I want you to view it this way. It's a reality check for all of us that whenever you are tempted to sin and you are willing to give in to that temptation, you are one of the ones driving the stakes into the arm of Jesus. You are lifting him up upon that cross Seeing the pain and agony in his face, when you give in to that temptation, you are taking part in that moment, whether you want to or not. So you've got to view it for what it is. View sin for who it's against. And also, number three, leave no room for compromise. Well, that's a tough one, isn't it? What are some of the things that we compromise our life and our relationship with Jesus Christ, what are some things that we compromise along the way? We compromise in our honesty. Our speech, we say words that we get around certain people, we say words that we wouldn't normally say around anybody else, but we compromise because we want to fit in. We want to be part of that group, so the best way to do it is to be like them, right? All that too. Leave no room for compromise. Listen, go back to Genesis 39 and verse 10. As she spoke to Joseph day after day. This was not a one-time situation, was it, good brethren? He says day after day, no, 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 no. He did not listen to her. Because the, the point is here, you ever listen to somebody about something until they convinced you of something? Bad companions corrupt good morals. You hang around it long enough, you listen to the story long enough, you start to believe that it's just okay, but in this case, he did not even listen to her. And number four, you've got to take aggressive action. Every time I read this story, even from the time I was a, a little man and reading this story, I kind of chuckled because he's running out of that room and he's without his outer garment. The only other person that I know of, possibly, in the New Testament that ran through a place like that was, was, was John Mark. But we're not, we don't know for sure that he was like that, but there are some that believe that. But in this case, he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. He took aggressive action. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. It says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. The final passage for you, this final two passages this morning for you, 
One comes from 1 Timothy and the other from 2 Timothy. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. So we're talking about staying cool in the heat of temptation. And I'm going to point out some things here as we close. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Every one of our young people here at the Waters Road Church of Christ, by the time they're six or seven years old, should be able to tell you what is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Walk out of those doors this morning. I challenge you to be able to do that. I challenge you to be able to share with your children those things which they should pursue in your life because when you're pursuing those things, it leaves a little amount of time, and I mean a very little amount of time, to pursue wrong things. And finally this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The initial call that you're going to make in your life for a clean conscience, a pure heart before God, is when you accept the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says, whoever believes in me and is baptized shall be saved. But he who disbelieves shall be condemned. Do you believe this morning, good folks, that God has made the way of escape from temptation for you? Do you believe it with all your heart? Because if you do and, and you see that from what we've studied this morning and you're not a Christian, the first avenue of escape for you this morning is to be buried with Christ in baptism, rise up out of those waters as a newborn babe in Jesus Christ. But if you're already a Christian this morning and you're like me, who deals with temptation on a daily basis, and you need the prayers of this church, your brothers and sisters, to help you overcome a weakness in your life. Maybe you've got a temptation you face on a daily basis. Maybe day after day, someone is coming to you, tempting you, or something is tempting you to do something you know is not right to do, or maybe you know there's things you ought to be doing, but temptation tells you don't do it, if we can help you with that this morning as we're about to sing this song together, I want you to respond. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to come down here on the floor, and I'm going to stand with you. And I'm going to ask anybody in this audience this morning, if you are somebody here who over your life, or even right now, is facing temptation. I want you to stand with me right now. If you're facing temptation in your life, stand with me right now. Now maybe this morning you came to church and you thought, I'm the only one who's struggling with temptation. I'm the only person that's going to be in that room who's dealing with a strong temptation. I want you to look around. Everybody is dealing with temptation in this room. Do you see that? So if we can help you while we sing this song, let us pray with you. Or if you need to put on Christ, let us rejoice with you as we stand and sing.